Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and if people continue coming, they'll we'll, we'll just uh, roll them right into the conversation. So I want to welcome everybody to the session on conducting equitable evaluations. I'm Ann Wolf, and I'm the project director for the APT team that provides evaluation technical assistance to EIR grants. Most of our evaluation focused presentations at the conference um, are led by members of the evaluation TA team. But for this session, uh, we are fortunate to have some guest presenters, Katrina Bledsoe and Ruth Jalande, who graciously agreed to share their expertise on equity in evaluation with us. Katrina is a principal of global equity, diversity and inclusion at APT Associates. She's an evaluator mixed methodologist and social psychologist. At APT Associates, she's responsible for developing equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies that center on culturally responsive and equity-centered research and evaluation approaches and theory-driven evaluation. Rucha Landi is a senior associate at APT and the co-director of the Equity Capability Center. She's an experienced human development specialist, evaluator, researcher, and technical assistance provider. Dr. Lundy is an expert at using uh, an equity lens for all her work, whether it's systematic evidence reviews, implementation and impact evaluations, content writing, resource development, or community outreach. So I'm very pleased to um, have uh, Katrina and Rucha with us today to, um, to talk to us about this important topic. Can we go to the next slide? Before we get started, I just wanna orient you to a few logistics and let you know that participants are muted uh, upon entry to the session in order to limit background noise. But you can still ask questions at any point if you have questions, you can use the chat feature in Zoom uh, if you need technical assistance, the session facilitator will respond to you directly in the chat panel to help you get the issue resolved. And if you have questions about the content of the session, um, the, uh, there'll be a chance at the end of the session to answer those questions, but you can type your questions in as they come up. So we'll be able to keep track of them and make sure to answer them. And um, we'll be monitoring the chat to answer any questions that need to be addressed on the spot. And with that, I will turn things over to Rucha, who um, is going to get things started. I think next slide. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, and can everybody hear me? Well, I'm not in my usual office setup, so I'm a little <laughs> worried. I want to make sure that everybody can hear me. All right. So as we get settled and started, and as we are still probably welcoming people into the room, into the virtual room, we would like if you feel comfortable uh, in sharing your name and your pronouns, um, your role with EIR, and quickly in three words, how you would explain what equity means to you. Again, not mandatory, just getting to know our audience here, getting to know who we are talking to would be helpful for us. Um, and just what are, what are the three words that come to your mind as you think about equity? Um, you're going to give us maybe a few, maybe a couple minutes or so to see if anybody wants to get us started um, before we dive into the content for today. Um, the reason why we are doing this is because we, we do have some slides that we want to share, but at the same time, we would love for this to be a, a discussion, a dialogue. So this is not just Katrina and I talking one after the other, but we really want to hear from the from the group that we have here today. So Jonathan has gotten us started. Thank you so much for sharing, Jonathan. Equality of opportunity. Um, that's great. It's a, it's a great start. We will be talking uh, through the through the next hour. We will be talking about the difference in equity and equality. Um, so this is a this is a good starting point. Uh, Rachel, thanks, Rachel, for putting in your comment, evaluation to uh, Rachel is with the evaluation team, fair involvement for all. Um, Ali says outcomes that are not predictable, 
I think but do when you say not predictable, they're not predictable based on some specific social identity um, uh, parameters like race or gender or ethnicity is probably what I, I think what Ali is saying. Access and representation, um, even playing field. Um, I think all of these are great. I think all of these are great, great starting points for us. So next slide, please. So what quickly, what we are planning to do today is uh, we are going to look at the definition of equity, and we're going to try to sort of tease apart what the key elements of that definition are, um, predominantly to understand the linkages between power, oppression, and equity. And after we do that, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what CRE is, culturally relevant equi equitable evaluation. And we talk more about what it is, but we'll be spending a bulk of our time later in the second half of our um, hour together today in applying those three principles to evaluation at various stages or various steps in the process of evaluation. So that's our plan for the, for the next hour together. Um, next slide, please. Before we jump into the definition of equity and talking about equity, we just have a quick poll for all of you all. We want to know from you if any one of you actually has heard of the culturally responsive equitable evaluation CRE, if you've heard about those approaches, um, if you are very familiar, to what extent are you familiar and you know about those. So if you don't mind, um, we, and that's, Amrita has just added the link in to the actual poll in the chat along with the passcode. So if you don't mind if taking getting to the link and taking the poll for us, um, that will just give us an understanding of where the familiarity about of Cree is within the audience today. And it will also give you all a chance to understand where you sit with regards to the other folks in your uh, in your group today. So I see people are taking the poll. Um, all right, all right. Still taking, the numbers are moving. All right, we are at about 18, 19, I'm still climbing, 20. So we are at about 20, 21 participants and Although they're although the participants are sort of all over the continent in terms of familiarity with the free work, um, I think a big chunk of folks uh, lie in the group right two ratings of um, I've heard of free or I have no idea what free is. There, but there are people that twenty nine percent of our group today actually is very familiar with free and also often use it in their work, which is which is great. So. Um, for all of those that are not so familiar, are hearing this for the first time, maybe even, um, we definitely want to hear from you what questions come to mind as you as you find out, as you understand more about Cree. Um, and at the same time, folks that have said that they have been using Cree in their work, we invite you to share experiences, share your uh, actual um, examples from the work that you're doing in the in the chat that would be really helpful for the entire group. So, um, in respect of where you are on that continent, we definitely want to hear from you. We want to hear. We want to have you participate in the conversation today. All right. So next slide, please. And one more. So let's start with, as I said, let's start with the definition of equity and then talk about some of the key elements within this definition. Equity means providing people with tailored support. And you will notice that in this particular um, in this particular slide, we have highlighted some of those concepts there. So it is support. Yes, it is support. It is resources. But the idea there is the tailored. It is what the individual needs, what the group or the community needs. The need is the big part in this, in the definition of equity. To achieve the best possible life outcomes by partnering with people most impacted. Again, partnering with people most impacted is highlighted there because what's important is what does that partnering mean? The part where 
the folks that are most impacted, the people that are most affected are the decision makers. They are invited to the table. They are at the table. They are the table in terms of decision making, making decisions to ensure that the system is governing their lives meets their needs. So it is folks that are most impacted are the people who are the, making the decisions about whatever it is, whether it's research, it's TA, it's evaluation, whichever it is. It is partnering in that sense. So I often um, I often bring up the uh, example that one of our colleagues, um, Drina obviously knows, or one of our, Drina and my colleagues used to say, um, equity is not a pixie dust that you come with and then sort of sprinkle and the, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm sprinkling the equity dust and now I'm done. That's not how we work with equity. If you are, if you want to use, if you want to use a lens of equity to everything that you do, that means you start off with the people that are most impacted. And then again, finally, what's really also important to know is equity accounts for the historic and current inequities, the ongoing inequities that lead to shared opportunity by targeting resources by need. Again, the need, the word need is of importance here. Next slide, please. So going through some of the key elements within equity here, as I said, accounting for historic and current inequities. We've already talked about historic and ongoing equities. The two big principles about equity are nothing about us without us and do no harm. The nothing about us without us is again connected to the partnership, the engagement piece of it, the engaging the partners um, who are most impacted, folks that are most impacted as decision makers. Um, and why? What, what is the purpose of doing that? The purpose is to increase the autonomy, the voice of these folks, of these folks that have been marginalized or ex excluded for all these years based on gender, race, ethnicity, age, ability, sexual orientation, and many other such dimensions. And we'll talk about some of these other identity dimensions and the concept of intersectionality in a bit. But the idea is that the, the, the partnering, the, the engagement of these people in this process, when you wear, when you use the equity lens, is to elevate the voices of these people. And then finally, again, talking about the tailored support, making sure that it is every person is getting what they need. They're, whether the, the support, the resources that they are getting based are based on what they need and what they need to lead the most uh, successful, the most accomplished lives for themselves. Next slide, please. All right, this is probably, uh, I often say that this is one of my favorite slides where um, the, the title says it all. Equity requires changes in process and outcome. It's both. A lot of times when we think about equity, we really do get focused into one of these two buckets, either the outcome, talking about equitable outcome, or talking about process. But if you really want to see equity being addressed in the real sense of the word, then you have to make sure that um, that it, it's the entire process, from the process part piece, along with all the way to the outcomes of what we are looking at. The process, when you're talk of, talking about equity in the process, what would that look like? All groups having access to all resources, resources and opportunities that are necessary that are necessary for their quality of life. And what would an equitable outcome look like? Is when you have these equitable processes, and when you're looking for that equitable outcome, then the differences in the life outcomes that people experience they cannot be predicted on the basis of race, class, and other dimensions of identity. That's exactly what um, Ali, I think you were mentioning in the chat earlier. Is that you just because you are of a certain race or of a certain gender or of a certain class should not predict what your life experiences are or where you end up in life and no one should be able to predict your sort of your life trajectory based on any of these dimensions of identity. Next slide please. This is where I said uh, earlier we had said that we would do a little bit of sort of distinguishing between um, equality and equity, often the two terms that get confused, that folks often get confused with. So when you look at this picture, what you see on the leftmost side, that's reality. That's that's the world today and has always been. There will be people who, who will have that big um, 
I don't know what to call it, a ladder or whatever it is to, that they are standing on to get a completely different worldview than somebody who is um, in that green shirt there. So that's the reality. What would equity, what would, ec what would an equal world look? What would equality look like? Where the resources, the scaffolding that's available to each one of them is the same. And that's what the second picture is about. But is, does that really mean that it changes what the person in the blue is able to see? Not really. When will the person be able to see beyond that fence is when you get to that third picture, which is about equity. It is giving those resources and giving access to those resources based on what each person's need is. And that's that. if we were to just stop at equity, that's where we would stop. But what I really like about this picture is that fourth picture on the right. It, that is where we really need to be. That is where, where I want to strive to be. And that which is getting rid of that fence at all. We don't need that fence. If the fence did not exist in the first place, then those that scaffolding or those that ladder or whatever that you want to call it, that wouldn't be needed at all because everybody would have the same view of the field. All of those three people would have the same view of the field. So that's where we are. That's where we are actually striving for as a society, or we should be striving for as a society. Yeah. And I was just going to jump in, Rucha, yeah. and say yeah. that um, yeah. that also, you know, we we look at this. I, I always like this um, this image a lot, but we're also trying to con consider that it's it's not it's not only the individual, but it's also the systems as well. And there are images out there that show sort of like what it looks like um, systems wide. Sometimes there's a lot of um, lot of resources going to um, one particular larger system, and then fewer resources um, going to others, and they both play together. So um, to that point, um, you know, sort of like adding a systems perspective here is that liberation piece is really being able to remove that systems piece. I think of the wall as the system um, and being able to have everybody be able to, uh, to be able to, to uh, participate and um, have life expectancy that way, so. Great, great point, Katrina. Yes, individuals and systems, great point. Um, next slide, please. So what we also wanted to do was bring in some additional definitions for understanding and realizing equity. And these are, again, some um, terms that are often used um, in similar spaces and could be confused, especially diversity and inclusion. We often see um, diversity, equity, and inclusion together, and they often get used uh, interchangeably. While they are related, they're not exactly the same. So the way I understand it, the way I like to sort of uh, conceptualize the difference between diversity and inclusion is when I think of diversity, in my mind, it is the what and inclusion is the how. So diversity is the ways in which human beings are similar or different. All of the different sort of demographics that each one of us brings with us or all, all of the different um, parts of identity that we have within us. Um, and also includes social positions, lived experiences. It's all of the what within us that we bring to our table. And how is the inclusion is to what extent, so diversity is to what extent do we include folks of these different demographics in our conversations at the table? And then inclusion is how, how do we involve them? Do we create that culture of environment or involvement with respect, connection, such that there will be diverse ideas, backgrounds, perspectives, such, such that this diverse group will actually feel free to share those diverse ideas, backgrounds, perspectives. That culture is about inclusion. So that's where diversity and inclusion differ, the what and the how um, within the same space. Accessibility is sort of one way or one piece within inclusion, ensuring that there's equitable access to everyone along the continuum of human ability and experience. And then culture is sort of this bigger, in my mind, it's sort of this bigger, bigger overarching body of um, learned and shared behaviors, values, customs, which is obviously playing a big part in understanding diversity, inclusion, accessibility. But so that's why I wanted to bring these phases because again, these all of these are related as you can see, but they are distinct in the flavor. Each of the term has a distinct flavor in terms of what it means. And, and, and that has obviously implications for how you actually implement it and bring it into your behavior. All right, next slide, please. 
So we've already talked about social identities and we've talked about the different uh, kinds of identities that each person brings to the table. And as I said, we talk a little bit more about intersectionality later. But yes, people experience the world differently. They are treated differently based on their social identity and um, uh, in terms of gender, my race, my age, uh, my ability status, sexual orientation, all of all of these, all of these different things that make up me, my experience of the world is going to be different. And people are going to actually behave differently with me when it comes to all of these. These changes, this, this way in which the world reacts to me and the way I experience the world impacts my daily life and also my access to resources um, and services. And understanding this is essential, is important, because that is going to help us reach the right people at the right time with the right support. And that is what equity is about. Remember, we started at the very beginning, we started talking about um, it's tailored support that meets the needs of the specific individual or the group or the community or the system. It's the tailored part of it. And that's why it's the right people at the right time with the right support. Next slide, please. Um, exclusion does happen. Exclusion happens based on any of these social, the, any, uh, any parameters of the social identity. Exclusion happens because, because of power inequality. There's power, there's a power differentiate, can't speak today. There's a power difference at the micro level as well as the macro level. At the micro level, you could be, you could be talking about the power difference in the, in, within specific individuals within households, or you might be talking about the macro, the communities, institutions, nations. So you could be talking about any of these sort of social levels within the society. There are power differentials happening at each of those. And again, how people experience the world, how people experience um, what is offered to them, what is not accessible to them, whether they are excluded, whether they're included, all of that depends on, depends on where they are coming from in terms of each of these social identities. People, uh, next slide, please. Could you just click one more time? There you go. People could be experiences, and these negative experiences could be from small inconveniences to bigger sort of discrimination, rigid social rules, fear or safe uh, for safety, extreme poverty. You just name it. You, it's like in in sort of the entire array of life, in the entire array of experiences, experiences of life, people would be experiences. People are experiences, negative experiences because of because of these social identities, what they bring to the table. Um, next slide, please. And these are those negative examples, or these are those inequities that I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to go over each of these. I know these slides are later made available to all of uh, the audience. And if you click on each of these um, links, um, you will see that they are actually clickable links and you can go and read the article. And I know each of those articles actually has data and I can use that in the audience today. We are all researchers, evaluators. We are all data people. And so you want to see the numbers, you want to see the data. And here are the data for you. Here's what, uh, what I'm talking about in terms of what's at stake. Persons living with disabilities live in poverty at more than twice the rate of people without disabilities. LGBTQ plus youth of color are overrepresented among youth experiencing homelessness. Um, black women are twice as likely to experience maternal death at childbirth than white women. I can go on and on. I can talk about the data around these, what the experience of the, of the, of the marginalized groups are. Um, but I, one thing that I do want to point out here, which sort of segues me into the next slide, is the, the top rightmost box, which talks about LGBTQ youth of color. So what's happening when you talk about that, when you look at that data, those data is we are getting into the concept of intersectionality, which is what I want to go, what, which is where I want to go next. Um, so we are talking about LGBTQ youth but we are talking about youth of color. So there are those two the sex sort of two parameters of social identity that are intersecting right there. Next slide, please. And that is what is gonna help us understand this slide, which is intersectionality. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the phrase intersectionality. It's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and what it means at the at the sort of most basic level is that 
individuals are not unidimensional, right? We are not single dimensional people. We have been constantly, since the, since the beginning of this session, 20 minutes back, we've been constantly talking about various different parameters or domains of social identity. And each person carries all of these different domains of identity within themselves. That is what we are talking about intersectionality. That's where intersectionality sort of stems from. Taking that concept a step further is that we have to understand all of these uh, multiple forms of inequity or disadvantage that compound together or that once they are brought together, they compound themselves and create obstacles that if we don't understand the compounded effect, if we try to look at isolated effect or feature of these inequities, we are missing out on we are missing out on the whole experience of the person and for for from the data perspective too as a evaluator you're missing out on the real story that your data is trying to tell you if you if we do not look at that intersectionality perspective if we continue to use that singular lens of reference for our data for understanding our data for meaning making meaning out of our data then we are really losing out on what our data are trying to tell us if our research is based on that sort of that um, single access theory or framework, then in some ways we are in fact distorting the data because the data are trying to tell us a story, a specific story, but we are not getting to that, getting to the bottom of that story because we are not, we are trying to sort of understand only the experience of the different genders, and now then separate from it, understanding the experience of the different races. That's not how it works. Even if you are talking about two women an experience of a black woman is going to be different from that of a white woman in a given circumstance, in a given sort of situation. And that is what intersectionality is. And as we go further into our discussion today, we will be talking a little bit more about bringing that intersectionality in your actual research. So when you talk about pre and you talk about how to apply that culturally um, relevant evaluation practices for uh, the various different steps within the evaluation process, we will bring back, we will come back to this idea of intersectionality and working with your data and keeping that lens of intersectionality. Um, next slide, please. So before we do that, before we get to the actual data steps, we want to talk about what culturally relevant and equitable evaluation actually is. And I am going to invite Katrina to start talking about Cree for us. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rucha. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate it um, uh, to be able to have this conversation. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, culturally relevant and equitable evaluation. I saw in the poll, I, I admit, I, I also took the poll as well. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but about a, a little over a third of folks really actually um, have certainly heard of it and then there's another third that's actually used it so definitely want to hear from folks as they're doing it because as you know this is a dynamic space um which is the, the sort of the beauty of life in general but also the beauty of research and evaluation so um i'm gonna uh, say next slide here so um for those folks uh this defining culturally relevant culturally responsive and equitable evaluation i'm using the expanding the bench definition um, and expanding the bench has been working in this space, uh, as well as those folks working in the equitable evaluation initiative. And we'll talk a little bit about there about that a little bit later. But the definition that they've been using, which is a CRE, which is requires um, an integration of diversity, inclusion, and equity in all phases of evaluation, not just one phase, but all phases. And it's an approach that really thinks about culture, structure, or structural or contextual factors, um, historical, social, racial, ethnic, gender, all of the things that we often like to control for. So we're bringing back all of that and bringing that into the evaluative space. But we're really talking about using a participatory process that really shifts power to those who are most impacted. Um, so it shifts, it really, um, Cree is looking to sort of shift the research and evaluation of power to those who are most impacted and also have us in that space that we are all equitable in being able to provide a story and to be able to give credible and valid information. So it's not just one method of evaluation. Um, it's an approach that should be infused about all evaluation methodologies. So 
Um, I've heard a lot of folks say, well, the Cree gets rid of RCTs. It does not. But what it does is it, it asks you to think differently about the questions that we ask and how we do the, the methodologies. Um, I think of it sort of like a kaleidoscope. You turn it a little bit, you get a different perspective on all of that. So we're trying to advance equity by informing strategy, program improvement, decision making, policy formation, and social change. So that's the way expanding the bench looks at it. And I'm going to say that Cree, when we're looking at it, we're also looking at, you know, Rucha mentioned about uh, equity in general, but we're also looking at equity in the evaluative and research process. So it's not just out there, it's also in the way that we do our work. Next slide. So, so what are some recommendations for bringing an equity perspective and lens to evaluation? I, I hear this all the time. I struggle with this as an evaluator and researcher as well. It's like, what does that mean for us? Uh, I'm going to say this. It does mean, a, it does mean time um, uh, to, to some degree. And, and instead of rushing through the process, we have to do a little bit of work on that. Um, thinking about uh, examining our own biases and our backgrounds, our positionality, making a commitment to dig deeper into the data and not just looking at what we see or what we've been told is uh, valid and, and what to look at and thinking about that the research process affects communities um, and that the fact that we roll into uh, a situation and that we're not just there as um, not making any, any kind of impact, but that we're part of this. And then we wanna engage communities and partners in the research process um, and by giving them credit, not just sort of like taking it in. I like to call it sort of the helicopter in or, and then helicoptering out that we're there and that we're part of the process. And then thinking, uh, trying to guard against the implied or explicit assumptions that white is normative um, and the standard and default position. And as I said in the session yesterday, one of the things when I um, was writing my master's thesis, I was told that was that was the standard. Um, and uh, that wasn't that long ago, <laughs> enough, but it wasn't that long ago. But that said, we have to move from that perspective because we have a very diverse society um, and uh, all citizenry should be, um, we should appreciate that and be able to bring everybody into the fold. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about applying Cree principles to evaluation at different points. Next slide. And I'm going to have, um, and if you can click through all of those, because I just want to talk about them all in one, in one session here, uh, about looking at and collaborating. And um, if you can click through. Um, through collaboration, evaluation design, data collection and dissemination. The reason we don't put this in a in sort of like a linear space is because in a Cree space and really think about it in a research space and an evaluation space, do we not come back to these at different particular times? Cree helps us um, be able to do this on a regular basis. When we're talking about collaboration and team building, we're talking about um, trying to think about how we in, how we connect with folks on a regular basis and what our teams look like. And then the evaluation design, we know that if we're doing any kind of evaluation that we should be prepared for changes at any time and that no one evaluation design is set in stone. It's a very dynamic space and Cree helps us sort of think about that as well. And then data collection and analyses that we think very broadly and we'll talk about data inclusivity and data equity a little bit later. And then also dissemination, how we think about this. We know that at different points, you will always have people who are, you're always gonna come back to this at any time. So we wanted to make sure that that we knew that these can be pressed on at any time. It's an iterative process and no real, what evaluation is really truly done. Um, we just simply stop, but you can always say, we can always continue to think about it and come back to it. And that we are trying to think very much about contextual issues and community issues. And that these change the evaluation design, our teams, our connect, our collection and analyses and dissemination at any time and throughout the process. Next slide. So um, if you can click through on that for me, that would be great. Um, wanted to talk about, so let's dig in a little bit about collaboration and team building, which we're talking about preparing for the evaluation. Okay, before you get to the design, you know you got to prepare for the evaluation and you got to think about it. Here's the space where you start doing some real digging. 
um, and often we're called in as evaluators and researchers, sometimes at the last minute, which is why we want to stay on top of these things. But in order to tell the real story or a story that seems credible and valid to most folks, you have to be informed about the sociocultural context. That includes thinking about the history, what got everybody there. Um, I like to use um, some things uh, uh, people might have heard, um, the five whys. Sometimes, well, why did this start? Well, why did that start? And then you keep asking questions. That's That goes back to some of the, the historical perspective. And then understanding what are some of the power relationships? Were there issues about structural racism or structural genderism that might have come up before then? And what does that, how does that, um, uh, how does that uh, influence what we're doing now? And then thinking about communication and relational styles. Sometimes we come in with a particular style and we think that others should be thinking about it in that same way and we miss things if we uh, continue there. So we have to think about that at the very beginning. Next. And then also thinking about our assembling and evaluation team whose collective lived experience fix the context. And um, I, I wanna say a, a, a moment here about this is that often um, we're sort of running around trying to pull together a team. Um, what we wanna do is we wanna be aware of cultural values, our own cultural values, our assumptions, our prejudices, our stereotypes, and then bringing in folks, um, uh, having them be part of the team in a real um, way that, that, that will allow folks to actually be able to equitably uh, contribute and think through and co-create. It's not merely about matching demographics. Um, it is because, uh, and I wanna say something here about tokenizing our researchers and tokenizing our evaluators and tokenizing our folks. Sometimes we run around and we're like, yeah, I need, I need a person of color. I'm gonna bring one there. That is not what this is about. It is about real thinking and being very, um, very intentional about how we're putting the team together. Next slide. So we'll click through on that. And we're talking about engaging stakeholders. And actually we should have, we should have changed that to stakeholders. We're calling them partners now um, in that way because there are partners. Stakeholders sometimes is a little more um, you know, distant, but we're really trying to think about how do we engage partners um, that that will be able to be part of the team. Uh, if we're developing a partner group, we wanna develop a partner group that's representative of the population served by the programs or the strategies. Um, nothing about us without us. Um, and, and often as researchers and evaluators were asked to do research on people, um, not with people. And so um, this here, we're trying to think very much about how we're gonna engage our partners. Next one. So we want to include people who are impacted by the program directly and indirectly. So it means really engaging with those who are most impacted. Um, I find that this is a really tough thing for folks because we're not, and neither are funders in a lot of ways, set up to do that. We're not very, you know, very good at um, including those. We're usually, again, very good at doing research on them. Next one, next piece. And then also paying attention to issues of power, status, and social class. Uh, I like to, and Ruchi knows this as well, that I like to, um, there is a, 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 an organizational development person, his name is Chris McGough, and uh, he talks about how we need to listen. When we're paying attention, we need to listen. We're not talking, we're actually talking about, we're actually trying to listen. And he says there's three ways, and I added a fourth one, which is people often talk about, they listen with the head or they think with the head, they may, they may engage with the heart or they may engage with the, the wallet. I say there's a fourth piece and I call it the psyche, being the social psychologist that I am, um, is that it's the psyche, which is all of that. How do we listen? We have to listen to issues of power, status, and, and social class. We have to also listen to what are some of the undertones that people are, are talking about. So in a way, we're not just the folks who are, who are collecting the data, crunching the numbers, putting our, together our designs. We're actually those folks who are really trying to listen and be there and um, be part of, of the larger uh, context. Next. 
So we want to include multiple voices because um, trying to listen, it's trying to be able to include multiple voices in a meaningful preparation and process and activities. We're, again, we're talking about meaningful engagement, meaningful inclusivity, and meaningful belonging on a team. Next piece. Finally, we want to make that, we want to create a climate of trust. Now, this is a lot, again, that research and evaluators don't often do. We're thinking we're going to roll in, we're going to do our thing. But we're talking about people's lives and the environment and the context that they live in. So our job is to establish as well our own relationship with those we are working with um, in that way. And I like to call it again, not trying to helicopter in and helicopter out, but will we be there um, afterwards and are we part of that community? Next slide. So just want to sort of uh, pull this together. The, a wide variety of folks have sort of pulled this together, NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, the um, Centers for Disease Control, um, and a, a variety of folks who have been talking about participatory research and have sort of laid out how we think about community involvement continuum. Um, I would dare say that there are a lot of folks we tend to work on the left side of the, um, of the continuum and it's not just enough to be on the continuum. The goal is to make it to the right side of the continuum um, where we have shared leadership if we're talking about an equitable evaluate, evaluation approach. Um, we understand that at times, you know, all we can do is outreach. We understand that, but the goal is to think with that in mind of shared leadership and being able to have a real bi-directional relationship um, full involvement where we are working with um, communities and teams and we're working on a regular basis. So it's not a hit it and quit it. It is really about being there um, and being part of the, the larger context. Next slide. So when, when you're thinking about community or equity and team building, what are some of the questions you want to ask? I'm going to invite people to put it in the chat. What are you thinking about when you're um, team building, when you're thinking about who to bring on the team and uh, what, what are you thinking about? So I'll give folks a, a minute and then I'll, I'll say a few words as well because always learning. So for those who are typing in um, there, I'll say in just a couple of words on this is that when I'm thinking about team building in this space, I wanna know who's on the team, um, what experience are they bringing and um, where, who do we need to be talking to? And um, what is some of the historical background? What, what's their positionality? I think about my own positionality. Um, those are some of the questions that we're asking in terms of bringing that team building and what's our commitment to um, the evaluative, equitable evaluative process and also to the community. Uh, the larger, uh, Kathy, thank you for that question. Um, I'm actually asking for both because the evaluation and research team and or the larger project team, one should be working in concert with one another. And I'm also asking those questions about exactly who's on the team, who's there, what are they bringing to the, to the table? And uh, you know, this is the thing, I think a lot of times research and, pro and uh, the project team seemingly think very differently and they're apart, but, we, but it's an integrated, it's a blend. Um, Research and evaluation can't work without the other. And I, I dare say that evaluation and research, good evaluation and research, it should be informative and should help um, move um, project work along. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. I was just gonna add it, Katrina. And I know yeah. that probably the, Kathy, I don't know where exactly your question was stemming from, but you might be thinking that, well, if I am the evaluator on the project, how much, uh, how much control do I really have on the larger project team and making sure I'm, I'm bringing in sort of equity and team building when it comes to the larger project team. But um, so it, we, and, and I, as an evaluator, I understand that, but it's about 
about the questions you want to ask as an evaluator or understanding, gathering that context around. Um, and sometimes we often, and I, as an evaluator, I often say this, that in, in, in a lot of ways, evaluation can be partly almost intervention in of itself. So by raising some of these questions, if the project team is not thinking about some of these areas, you are helping them think in that direction. So you're almost like helping um, lead some of that discussion, which may or may not be happening. Right, and and Robin, thank you for that, um, that you also built in the, the chat as well. And thank you, Rucha, for that as well. Um, but I know that you said that you built in funds that support community involvement in all your grants, but for many, engaging in leadership of research project is burdensome for those most impacted. How have others approached this? Um, I'll tell you some of the things that I've done. We've built in that as well. I mean, we've when we have gone into uh, communities, we've sort of built that in as is, um, you know, not just about the, the community involvement, but really trying to make it worthwhile, including um, being able to compensate equitably um, to make it worthwhile. Um, that's, that, you know, doesn't solve everything, but it does help in some ways to be able to do that. We just haven't done that. One, we don't budget well for evaluation and research. Um, and then the other piece is that we often don't budget for the time it takes to get um, involved, it's burdensome partially because we don't take the time to get to get to know folks and and then value what their contributions are. So then it's sort of like, oh, we got this little, you know, this uh, this access or this other, um, you know, it's something else we have to do. But thank you, and then and then thank you, Rucha, and then to budget to compensate. So um, I just want to say because I know we just have a little bit, but I'm going to try and get through all of this. Um, so. Evaluation design, why design with equity in mind? Okay, and a lot of times I hear this, I still hear this from folks, but that's because you know I feel like I'm sometimes in a bubble doing, doing this work, but I still hear from folks like, well, you know, we're simply information brokers. That's not what an equitable evaluation is, de is designed for. We're designing with equity in mind, not just for what we're looking at, but also in the process. So the equitable evaluation initiative, um, is a, a probably number one in this space and trying to think about, and they have worked primarily with philanthropic organizations and philanthropic sectors, but this has actually gone worldwide, um, international development, as well as our US context, that evaluation and evaluative work should be in service of equity. It's not just knowledge for knowledge sake. We're not just doing research just to do research. We're really trying to move something forward. And we're trying to uh, think about um, how we're going to manage it and how we're going to actually do, do evaluation and what is the purpose of doing it. Second, evaluative work should, uh, should answer critical questions about um, the ways in which historical and structural um, decisions are made. Um, we need to think about how an uh, effect of, and a strategy has an effect on populations and you know, thinking about what are some of the underlying issues of this. We're supposed to be answering critical questions about this. And then third, evaluative work should be designed and implemented commensurate with the values underlying equity work. It should be multiculturally valid. And then also it should be um, trying to or orient towards participant um, partnership and ownership. Often we like the, the funder is, we've thought of as the funder is the owner of the data, but it's really, it's really tough to do that because we're basically saying, well, you gave your stuff away, so now I own you. Um, so this space here is really about it is about those who are most impacted. They own the narrative, they own the data. Next slide. So um, the evaluation purpose, I'm gonna actually um, have you click through all of those so we can just look at all of them at the same time, which is the, what's the identity, when we're trying to get the identity, the evaluation purpose, what do we wanna know? document program, program implementation? Do we want to know how well programs are connecting with uh, communities? Are the program's resources equitably distributed? 
Um, are we trying to document progress towards goals? Who's benefiting from the program? Is the program theory or what we think how it's going to work? Is it culturally sensitive, culturally relevant, culturally humble? Um, is what about uh, evaluating? If we're thinking about evaluating implementation, um, we wanna be able to capture cultural nuances. We wanna be able to look at contextual correlates of participant outcomes. We know that different situations yield different um, responses. And then finally, we want to be able to evaluate the effectiveness, um, which is looking at the differential outcomes for different populations. What does it mean? And then centering intersectionality and in understanding group differences. And just want to make a point here about intersectionality is that as Rucha was talking about, and there's some research out there that's now coming out, is that we tend to do things binarily. <laughs> so I'm just going to make that up, you know, in a way that it's you're either or. And then at the end in the, the analysis, we try to bring it together. Now we're trying to think about this space. It's hard to divorce one from the other, although we tend to make people make that choice. Um, but here, when we're talking about in an equitable evaluative process and a pre-evaluative process, we're really talking about recognizing the whole gestalt, the whole person. So if somebody's doing um, something that affects black women, immigrant, LGBT, that's considered the whole, not every little piece of that. And I'm not saying that we're not interested in, in binary perspectives, but Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who Rucha mentioned earlier, really talked about the fact that by doing those binaries, we missed the issues that affect a group that, that, that is dealing with a whole perspective. So we know that if we're talking about women, well, what women are we talking about and what are their experiences? And that, and that varies by their experience, by their social identity and by how we have, uh, we have categorized them as well. Next slide. So designing the evaluation, we wanna think about like construct, con uh, construct control or comparison groups in ways that are respectful to cultural context. I'm not going to read all of these, but I'm going to give you a couple of key points. Language and context of instruments should be uh, culturally sensitive. I know people are always thinking, oh, I'm going to put this in a different language, but we have to really think about dialect and what that means and uh, designing the instruments with that in mind. So, and then using best translation practices and then understanding um, you know, what, what's considered good evidence, what's considered credible evidence, what's considered reliability and validity, and that may be contextually um, um, developed. Next slide. So what are some of the evaluation questions that we ask and that when I ask, I, just some of the things that's like, okay, can we develop um, if we're going to be working with different dialects, different communities um, within a group and not looking of, not just looking as a, as a group, as a monolith, I start asking questions of like, how can we best develop an instrument that fits um, population A, population B? That might be some of the questions I might ask. I might also ask in terms of the, the design of like, I wanna know what questions are we actually asking? And if we're thinking about questions about historical perspective, if there's power differentials, we want to ask some of those questions as well. Next slide. So data collection and, uh, and analysis ensure data equity, which um, we want to make sure if we're talking about data equity, that all pieces or all aspects of, of the data are actually being looked at and um, in, a, in a realistic way that we're not pri prioritizing some versus the other. And we know that in a lot of instances, um, I'll just say qualitative and quantitative debate, I'll leave it there. And then also the data inclusivity is being able to include, make sure that all people are included and all their perspectives are included. It's a lot, I understand this as well. We were all trained in a particular way about trying to make things very simplistic, but the world isn't. And we have to actually really try to be those folks who try to, to, to tell an, enough of a story that as, as much as we can. You know, as evaluators, we're all being looked, asked to, um, to um, you know, evaluate poverty, evaluate change in equity, all of these things. And that requires us to really think about the kind of data that we're bringing in, 
all people included and not being able to sort of uh, to, to sort of weed things out in that. And it's it's just a perspective. It's a different perspective, not right or wrong. It's a different perspective about how we're trying to look at the world. Next slide. So I'll just say a couple of things on, on collecting the data. Um, qualitative and quantitative, this is one of the, this is one of the beauties of being a, a, a mixed methodologist is being able to synthesize and see and triangulate and see how it all fits together, recognizing how cultural identifications can of the evaluation teams can affect what we hear, which is why mo moving and working with um, people who are in the community, with the community, and having them be part of the evaluation teams helps us understand because left to our own devices, we're going to use what we have. We're going to use our own positionality. So we always want to be able to have that. And then shared lived experiences provides optimal grounding. Um, so being able to have folks who live the experience, who are in the experience, and, and best case scenario, if we've been able to live the experience as well, that is very helpful. Next slide. So when we're analyzing the data, we want to have a cultural interpreter. I can't say enough about this because of the fact that we want to be able to capture the nuances of meaning. Stakeholder, excuse me, partner review panels can more accurately capture the complexity of the cultural context. We, we want to ask folks because, again, left to our own devices, we'll use what we have. And if we don't have those experiences, and even so, if we have those experiences, we don't speak for everyone. Um, trying to examine outliers, especially successful ones. Often we like to put those in there. We like to push those to the side, but we're really trying to tell a, a, a comprehensive story and that is representative and that is um, most, ag most agreed on and is the narrative for those um, who are most impacted. And then just remember that data are given voice by those who interpret them. So I used to have a friend who would say, I always take the notes because I can interpret the notes the way I want to. Think of that when we're talking about that as well, that we wanna bring in those folks. Next slide. So questions that I often ask in this space are who's analyzing the data? Who should be at the table? What does this mean? And, um, and then also, are there any structural issues? Are there any other underlying pieces that, what's the landscape and the assumptions that we're using in terms of data collection and analysis and practice? Next slide. So reporting and dissemination, I'm gonna have you click through as well, just so I can look at all of them, um, which is we wanna, here's the thing where I feel like we often struggle, which is we need to be aware of how we express things. We wanna say things on our personal first language. We usually provide a report for the funder. And what we're really talking about is we gotta be able to say what we mean, and then also being able to understand that there's variations within groups. Don't assume differences by race, don't bring in your biases when you're reporting. Um, that's not going to work and because you're going to end up reporting on different things that might not be true. And then also provide context. We often don't provide context of where this data comes from, how we're reporting it, and the limitations of that. Sometimes we do, but we usually are doing it from the limitations of the, of the methods, but not in the way of how we're thinking about the analysis and all of that. So we have to put that up there. Next slide. So when we're disseminating and using the results, uh, we got to think about who's going to be using them. And you all know there's multiple people there and we're all talking about like there's tweets, there's Facebook, there's every, how do we want to get this across? And on top of that, who can hear what? What are they interested in hearing? Um, and then what questions are relevant? It's not always the funder. It's really about those who are most impacted. What makes sense to them? And then how can they hear it? How can we consider community benefit and change and then making consistent, um, make our use consistent with the purpose of the evaluation? Next slide. So what questions do we wanna ask? Who can hear what? What do they wanna know? And, um, and then how, how can we bring them in, in the, uh, as part of the reporting process as well? Next slide. So we're at 120. 
thank you so much. But we want to encourage you to think about this for further discussions. What questions do you have about CRE and the framework? We still have questions about this, and it is a it is a um, dynamic framework. And then how can you use this framework in the work that you're doing? We know that people can't, that it's not always going to be um, you're going to be able to do, use all of it. We're not using it as an all or nothing, but we want to know that um, we hope that you'll think about this as you use this. This was sort of the quick and dirty version of this. We hope that you will ask us questions and continue the conversation, and we thank you for coming. Thank you very much.